This is Kirby. He's great. I love this guy. He's had a solid career over the years. Multiple quality mainline games, multiple quality spin-offs. From Kirby tilting and tumbling on the Game Boy to hosting his own Kirby Battle Royale, this dude has done it all. But one interesting thing about this character is ever since his debut in 1992, he's never really had a proper transition to a 3D space. We've had all these consoles that are fully capable of 3D games, and yet HAL Laboratory never fully dipped their baby boy's toes in the 3D realm. Kirby and the Z-axis? Well, that's an ability Kirby couldn't copy, apparently. A couple weeks ago, I took a look at technically Kirby's first experience in a 3D space with Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards, and if you haven't seen that, I, uh, I highly recommend giving that a watch. But uh, anyways, it was basically just a little tease and was barely on the line of 3D with a 2.5D engine, but it wasn't the full-on 3D adventure I think most people were expecting. But obviously, Kirby wasn't done after his 64-bit release. It wouldn't be long till Kirby would quite literally take a step forward in the 3D realm. It was only a matter of time. Oops, <laughs> spelling error, how embarrassing. <clears throat> it would be long till Kirby would quite literally take a step forward in the 3D realm, like a long, long time. It only took HAL Laboratory 30 years to figure out what these bad boys can really do. September 23rd, 2021, Nintendo announced Kirby in the Forgotten Land, Kirby's true full dive into 3D. It was an exciting moment for all the Kirby fans out there, and I and many others were pretty shocked to see Kirby like this, but personally, I felt a stronger sense of it's about time. With it releasing on Kirby's 30th anniversary year, I think it was a great way to celebrate the occasion. 30 years Kirby has been stuck on a 2D plane, and naturally it only made sense for him to eventually take a stab at a 3D adventure. So on March 25th, 2022, Nintendo bit the bullet, and Kirby in the Forgotten Land was released worldwide. Today, I'm going to be sharing my thoughts and feelings with Kirby's true official dive into 3D. It's been a long time coming, but it is finally here. Will Kirby's formula translate well in the 3D realm, or will it suck? Only one way to find out. And you dropped it. Oh my gosh. We've literally been over this. You're supposed to catch it, show it at the camera, and put it in the end. You dropped it again. Oh my. Okay. All right. Just, just go put it in the switch. Okay. I don't have time for this. Oh. All right. Okay. Thank you. So right off the bat, the game really got on my good side. You see, I'm not really the biggest story guy, and the game wastes no time with that. Kirby's just kind of doing his own thing and randomly gets sucked up in a vortex, washes up on a new world, and from there you're kind of just thrown right into the action with no explanation whatsoever. After exploring the new land for a bit and witnessing a Kirby anime opening, you stumble across a Waddle Dee town being raided and this furry little creature running for his life, but he eventually gets cornered and captured. After beating up some dudes and saving him, he introduces himself and Elphalin joins your party. And uh, that's uh, that's it. Aside from Elphalin introducing himself and Waddle Dee's being kidnapped, there's not much explanation. No backstory to the land, no character origins, or anything. Like, literally, the story isn't really continued or fleshed out till the very end of the game. And for the most part, you're running around saving Waddle Dees with no explanation on why they're even captured in the first place. Throughout the game, there are subtle visual hints involving the story, but the beauty of it is, is it gives you the freedom to figure out what's going on on your own. Or at least that's what it wants you to do. I, for one, had no idea what was going on, and I was just too busy having a blast. <laughs> It never forces or shoves the story in your face, and I really respect that. I mean, like, most Kirby games are like that anyways, but I gotta say, it's nice to see that the game prioritizes its gameplay more than anything else. And it shows. Kirby and the Forgotten Land feels amazing. It's fluid, it's satisfying, it's great. The Kirby formula translates extremely well into 3D, like I can't stress it enough, it's incredibly seamless. Sucking up enemies, copying abilities, Kirby's movement, literally everything feels fluid and natural. And I don't know what it is, but eating and spitting out enemies is so satisfying to do, I can't really put my finger on why that is, but honestly, the whole game in general is just filled to the brim with satisfaction. 
I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty addicted to the game at times, just because of the constant satisfaction it would throw at you. Whether that was eating an enemy, or slicing and dicing bosses, or collecting a caged waterly, and it felt like it just never stopped. Like Kirby in the Forgotten Land, more like Kirby in the freaking dopamine-filled land. Like, jeez. What I'm trying to say is Kirby in the Forgotten Land is such a feel-good game, and I really gotta give HAL Laboratory props for Kirby's evolution to the 3D realm. It just feels so natural, and for a franchise that's never done something like this before, that's a huge accomplishment in my book. They took Kirby's core formula we all know and love, but also sprinkled in aspects very similar to some of Mario's best games, and that's one franchise I don't mind Kirby copying in the slightest. The game is mainly linear in its design. You go through level by level, world by world, just like any other Kirby, but in terms of its level design, it kind of reminds me of Super Mario 3D World, but with more expansive areas and verticality. Although the levels have a linear path to the end, the game offers different objectives and tons of secrets hidden throughout the adventure. In most levels, it does a great job at keeping you on track to the goal, but it also rewards you for exploring every nook and cranny off the beaten path. The levels themselves are packed with hidden rooms and collectibles, and some of these are genuinely clever and hard to find at times. And almost all the levels are big enough to where you'll most likely be playing them more than once if you're wanting to collect everything within them. The level design strikes a very good balance of being linear, but also not being afraid of allowing the player to explore. It actually encourages it. And with this balance, it makes the levels have more depth and are all around more enjoyable and memorable. But if I'm being honest, I don't really think you'll be having a hard time remembering some of these levels because these things are popping. Like, oh, oh, man, these graphics are blinding me with all that shiny polish. Oh my gosh. What, what am I doing? This game looks fantastic. There's a lot of good looking games on the Switch, and I would definitely put this one up there as one of the best. Playing through the first world was, you know, pretty standard, but the moment I set foot in the tropics, wow. A lot of the areas are like a perfect mixture of cartoony and Kirby and rugged and abandoned. I love the detail put in a lot of these areas, and by far one of my favorite things is the cinematic camera shots of the worlds. The camera will be zoomed out, giving you a brief look at the expansive world around you. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's such a nice little detail that just complements the grand scope of each world so well. One thing I really enjoyed about the worlds is they never oversaturated their theming. Each world had a specific theme, but the levels themselves never really blended together and brought whole new experiences in different areas. Like take for example the snow world, probably one of the easiest themes to reuse. You start in this snowy old town, but then you get to the next level and you're in an underground ice subway, and then in the next one you're in a flooded icy industrial area, then finally you're on a giant blizzardy bridge. The levels are memorable because almost every single one is a new experience from one another, both in its level design and especially in its graphical theming. With these amazing graphical levels, I'm sure the developers needed some major optimizations to make the game run smoothly, and while it does run great with a solid 30 FPS, unfortunately in most levels you can visibly see drawbacks to help make it run smoother, specifically in the frame rate of enemies and objects in the distance. It's a pretty minor complaint. There were a handful of times where it was very noticeable, but it's nothing game-breaking or anything. Like I said, it is for optimization, and the game runs solid, so I mean it's doing its job. It just can look a little jarring at times. I applaud Nintendo and HAL Laboratory. The game legit looks and feels great, in my opinion. Animations are smooth, levels are unique, and like every Kirby game, it's overflowing with charm. But I haven't even touched on what makes Kirby, well, Kirby. Is it even a Kirby game without the copy abilities? Well, actually, like, Kirby's first game didn't have copy abilities, so, so like, they can be, but, like, Kirby's, like, more known for that nowadays, so, uh... Yeah, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Let, uh, let's just, let's just go back. Okay, I'm sorry, let's, let's just go back. In Kirby's latest adventure, he has a decently sized arsenal to work with. 
Lots of iconic abilities make a return, but with a little more razzle-dazzle. For the most part, there wasn't really an ability I didn't like. They were all pretty fun in their own ways. Some of them felt kind of clunky in some cases, but overall I think almost all of them are satisfying and feel good to control. But I think the reason for that is with some of these abilities making the transition to 3D, they just feel a lot better in general. There's so many more elements and variables to work with. The combat itself is a lot more fun to me. I think the hack and slash feel of Kirby is a lot more fleshed out in the 3D space, especially when it comes to the bosses. And I just love the feeling of smacking these enemies left and right and obliterating them out of existence. The game only has about 12 abilities total, but throughout my playtime, I never felt like they were lacking really, mainly because throughout the game they were constantly changing and evolving with the new copy evolutions. Hidden throughout each world are these ability scrolls that can be traded into this Waddle D workshop to upgrade your abilities. I think this is really cool. The feeling of progressing with character stats isn't seen all too often in Kirby games, so it's a nice change from what we usually see. I think the only downside I see from this is they're just simply upgrades. I mean, that is what they're advertised as, and that's not a bad thing at all. I think they're good upgrades with great changes all around, but if you're expecting completely new copy abilities with each evolution, you might be disappointed. I still like the mechanic though, it does add a tiny bit more depth to the combat that complements the game a lot. There's two levels of evolution for each ability, but every single one comes with a price tag. And that's when the Treasure Road comes into play. Each evolution costs rare stones to upgrade. The way you get these rare stones is in the Treasure Road portals scattered across each world. They're basically little time trial challenges themed after specific copy abilities. At first I was a little skeptical, thinking they might get stale after a while, but honestly I think they did a good job having tons of varying challenges with multiple abilities and evolutions. I think it's a neat way to familiarize yourself with each ability and showcase the full extent of every power. However, I would be lying if I didn't say I was getting a little sick of them by the end of the game. Again, it's not that they're stale, it's just the feeling of being constantly bombarded with them. After every single level they appear, and I found myself kind of getting annoyed with the amount that was spawning. I don't think it's a problem for many people out there, but personally, I think I had my fair share by the time the last world rolled around. Now, it wouldn't be a Nintendo game without the company's favorite G-letter word. I just thought I would emphasize it a little bit. Also on the list of Kirby's mechanics is Mouthful Mode. It's exactly what the name implies, it's just Kirby stuffing his face with whatever he can fit. First things first, I just want to say, I think this is pretty funny. A lot of his transformations are just so fun and charming, like things like Carby or, or, or Combi or like Lightbulby. <laughs> I don't know, that one's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> Seriously though, these are some fun gags that spice up the game nicely. They sort of act like keys to progress the level, but a lot of the time they'll have full-on sections to themselves. They really remind me of Odyssey's capture mechanic, they're pretty similar in a lot of ways. They're really nothing too crazy in terms of game mechanics, they're more amusing than anything. A lot of the time they'll have platforming sections or just simple challenges sprinkled in each level, or sometimes they're simply used to make a cutscene or an animation more polished and interactive. Again, I just can't express how charming they really are. I love the way Kirby waddles with the cone or seeing Kirby's body stretched and gliding in the air. I think it's a gimmick that fits Kirby very well, and I thought they did a good job thinking of clever transformations. Then again, we are talking about Nintendo here. Nothing else to say, really. Uh, it's a nice, engaging compliment to a lot of the levels. Mouthful mode? Uh, you get a thumbs up from me. I liked it a lot. Speaking of mouthful mode, my mouth has been full of compliments to this game, and that's because I couldn't really find anything I didn't like. I mean, of course, there are some gripes here and there, like the figurines the game had you collect were pretty lame in my opinion, but uh, what else am I going to say about that? They're optional collectibles that I didn't bother collecting. Uh, that's the basically the gist of it. But okay, I'm sorry if I went a little overboard with the negativity there. Let's quickly go through some more things that I actually did like. One thing I wanted to talk about briefly is Waddle D Town. This is your main hub of the game, and it's such a nice little place to hang out, and over the course of saving and collecting Waddle Dees, the town expands and more buildings start to appear. 
This is where the copyability workshop is and where all the minigames are stored, including fishing. There's a Coliseum boss rush building. Kirby Tilt and Tumble makes a grand return, sort of. There's a grand theater where you can watch different clips and Kirby even has his own house. There's a pretty decent amount of things to do here and it's such a fun, wholesome hub world and probably the best thing about it is you can literally wave at all the Waddle Dees in town. They didn't have to put this in at all, and yet here I am dying of cuteness overload. One small gripe I will mention though is the health and power-up shops were completely useless. I think I only bought one item my entire playthrough. And I think part of the reason for that is you can literally sleep in Kirby's house to restore your health for free, so I don't really know why they even offered items. You can buy and store items to use for later, but there were only a few moments where this would be useful. Did you catch that? Here, I'll rewind it real quick for you. Only a few moments where this would be useful. A few moments. I almost died in a Kirby game. Okay, I actually lied. I, in fact, died a couple of times. Seriously though, I know this topic can be talked about to death when it comes to Kirby, but I will say the game's difficulty is an improvement for sure. Right from the very beginning, the game offers you two different difficulties, Wild Mode and Spring Breeze, and although Wild Mode was still a breeze in terms of difficulty, it was at least difficult enough to make it a way more enjoyable experience all around. The platforming wasn't really affected by any of this. I mean, when you have a character that can basically fly, there's obvious reasons for that being the case. But I mainly saw this in the combat, which again, adds a lot more depth to it, which is always nice. I especially saw this in the bosses. I really enjoyed both the main and mini bosses of this game. Designs are very sick and big in scope and lots of variety in terms of attacks. Because of the game's third dimension, they had a lot more to work with. Multiple phases with each boss, every single main boss had a unique way of using the area around them to their advantage, and near the end, a couple of them actually got me down to pretty low health. And for some people that may sound super lame, like, oh, he got me down to low health, but for a Kirby game, that's a step forward in the right direction. Again, I wouldn't say the game is hard by any means, but there's definitely a noticeable balance compared to previous games in the franchise, and I think that's definitely worth highlighting. As you can probably tell, I really enjoyed Kirby and the Forgotten Land, and my list of pros versus cons makes that even more obvious. For being Kirby's first official 3D game, it's so natural. It feels like he's right at home, really. The way the developers seamlessly design Kirby's world and feel over in the third dimension cannot be understated. It's fluid in design, beautiful in so many ways, has greatly crafted levels, and has well-executed gimmicks that enhance the charm in ways that a franchise that already specializes in that department has never seen before. It's hard to say whether or not this is the next evolution of the Kirby franchise. It's interesting, I don't think Kirby will completely trance over to 3D games from now on, but judging by the general reception the game is getting, I can confidently say this won't be the last time we'll see Kirby like this. There's really not much else to say, it's an incredibly charming 3D platformer. Even if you're not a fan of Kirby, I still recommend it 100%. Trust me, if you're wanting a game that's relaxing, fun, and will more than likely make you smile, then Kirby and the Forgotten Land is right up your alley. I'm such a sucker for 3D platformers, and Kirby and the Forgotten Land is truly an unforgettable experience. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video and want to support me in any way, just liking, commenting, and subscribing just makes me smile. It makes me happy. And so I just want to thank you for all the support and uh, I will hopefully catch you later.